Hello everyone from Tokyo, Japan. This is William Laurent. I am a tech and lifestyle journalist and my mission statement is to make AI and Web3 fun. So today I want to talk about artificial intelligence in music. I want to talk a little bit about what's going on and narrow down on some issues with intellectual property and uh, sort of predict where the future goes for AI, both for the record companies and for musicians. So let's get into it, shall we? All right. Okay. So before we get into the, I think the issues, it's, it's important to look at the broader picture of AI music, where we are and what has happened, I, I would say, that are, you know, seminal moments in the last 10 to 20 years. And really, there's three things that stick out that have sort of paved the, um, the, the course for where we are right now uh, with respect to AI technology. So it was difficult to, uh, I think, identify um, these landmarks, but I chose three. The first being the uh, Iamis computer in 2012, which really shook up the classical music world as it created a full-scale AI orchestral composition, ironically entitled Hello World. Um, this was the first time that AI had composed a piece that was performed by a major orchestra. AI had composed pop tunes, it composed plenty of other things, but to have a major orchestra, the London Symphony in this case, play an AI-generated song obviously uh, created a lot of controversy in academic circles, but it was still largely ignored by the by the you know broader, I would say, uh, musician uh, community. Uh, and then we had Google's Project Magenta. That was 2016, where they used a much more sophisticated machine learning algorithm uh, to create breakthroughs, not only in digital music, but also in art. And this utilized TensorFlow. And this is why this is important, is this is a publicly available open source machine learning library that with a little bit of work and a little bit of mathematical background, um, anybody can really put this to work for them and create create music. And I shouldn't say a little bit of work. It does take a good deal of work. But the point is here that it was it was technology that was largely publicly accessible. And then jumping forward uh, to the uh, last couple of years, we had OpenAI Jukebox, which is a huge, huge controversial step and uh, important leap in AI generated music where anybody with no experience in AI, no experience in music, no talent in music could actually produce music that was listenable, that was harmonically and melodically pleasing, that mimicked a specific artist in multiple gen genres. So uh, that's a look at three things that I thought were pretty important to sort of set the background for where we are right now. Um, what is the problem with all this? Well, there's a lot of problems. There's a lot of good. Um, where you have innovation, you have adaptation. I'm uh, sorry. Where you have innovation, you have um, a threat, and then you have adaptation. We'll look at some of that, but I wanted to talk about one of the major threats, right? Which is the this issue of intellectual property. Um, and if I can sum it up in one sentence, I would say current copyright laws don't fully account for AI's role in music creation. So let's start from there. We don't have clear guidelines on copyrights or copyright law still for machine generated content or content that was generated by AI machine learning algorithms. The issue is that um, you know everything is sort of <laughs> up for grabs right now with AI created work. Um, the authorship, the copyright, who owns what, um, who's going to get royalties for what? It, there's many things right now that are being litigated. But I think there's more. Uh, there are more um, cases that are about to be litigated. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to dwell on that too much. We'll stay high level. Um, but my point is that the existing legal frameworks that we have in the U.S. are built around human authorship, right? Um, and the issue is the lines around what constitutes human authorship have been severely blurred, right? Um, so 
is it me creating the piece of music? Is it the AI creating the piece of music? Is it the algorithm, which could be proprietary, right? That algorithm could have a copyright on it too. So we're really all over the place, right? Um, who owns a piece of music when it's created by AI? Now, I don't have the answer. Maybe you do, or maybe you have some thoughts I'd love to hear. But let's think of the possibilities. Is it the programmer, right? Is it the actual user of the AI platform or the software? Is it the singer that the AI mimics, or maybe the guitar player in a band or the drummer in a band that has a unique sonic signature? You know, is it the AI algo itself? Um, so we have to look at the recent guidance and uh, what has come out of the Copyright Office in the US. And the recent guidance states, works created by AI without human invention or involvement can't be copyrighted. Okay, um, well, so then we have to understand how much human involvement do we have in that AI creation process? And what rights can we assert against it? Again, everything is a gray area. Everything can be litigated and debated, I think, very effectively one way or the other. So we're at a point now where our fair use and copyright laws need to be revamped. Um, these IP issues, and the issues of intellectual property, the issues of who created this, who owns it, um, need to be deliberated, litigated, and formally codified. And that's going to take a long, long time. There's going to be a lot of back and forth, expensive uh, back and forth. It's a good time to, to be a lawyer right now. So um, my point is, what constitutes originality? creativity and ownership will be redefined. It must be redefined. So uh, we're headed to uh, really, AI is forcing us to a very new frontier, a very interesting place right now in um, copyright law. Okay, on to my next slide. So I wanna talk about what's going on uh, and drill into that, what's going on in the last year or two, right? Um, we've sort of laid out what those landmark uh, events were in, in music, but let's look at where we are now. So uh, the title of this slide is Way Beyond Sampling. If we look at the controversies in music plagiarism back in the 70s, there was a very famous case in 76, George Harrison had a top 10 song that plagiarized another song. And that song was My Sweet Lord, which plagiarized the Chiffon's He's so fine. And the melody went something like da 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 da. And if you listen to the song that Harrison wrote and you listen to the original song, they sound exactly the same, the melody. Harrison lost. <laughs> and the verdict sent significant repercussions throughout the industry. Um, AI makes this case look so quaint and so simple um, because. It, it, it's very difficult now for us to be able to assert that a uh, musician consciously or subconsciously was plagiarizing or, or copying, right? Um, the question is now, does creating music using AI based on another's work constitute making a derivative work? So music in the style of someone else is usually not considered a derivative work under copyright law, but there are gray areas there again too. Um, and then if we can say that, okay, the work is highly derivative, what constitutes the fine line between inspiration and infringement? So um, creating songs in the style of a famous artist without direct sampling is something that we've never encountered before. So I like, Billy Joel, I play the piano. Um, if I have the AI mimic Billy Joel's voice, even though he's not singing those words, even though he didn't write the melody that the AI has written, say it's something completely new, is that infringing on Mr. Joel's trademark in, in some, some way? So that is a question that will be answered with a lot of, I think, pain for litigants on 
both sides, the record companies, the AI algo companies, or people creating the AI algos, the musicians creating the music. Um, and then we get in also, if we get in a little bit deeper, we get into the issue of training. So if I take a song by, say I take uh, a song by Paul Simon, right? Uh, 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover. And I train the AI with that song to create something completely different. Is training with something that is copyrighted, is training that AI and having the AI learn, does that infringe the copyright of the original music owner, Mr. Simon? So um, there is a lot to be answered in the short, mid, and long terms, right? Is it only the completed product that we are going to have an issue with that somebody could say, hey, you've violated my trademark, my copyright, uh, or is it the actual training process itself? And then the other question that I have been asking myself is, is it really ethical to use AI to mimic a deceased artist's style or vo voice? Not only does it probably violate the um, artist's estate, uh, but um, it could have a, a negative emotional impact for fans. Now, um, again, that's very subjective, but I think there are uh, some areas that are probably going to uh, need to be, again, litigated and, and, and codified in the law of you know, what constitutes uh, infringement and what is fair use. All right, on to the next slide. So I want to talk a little bit about how AI music is created because to understand legal gray areas, we need to understand the actual process itself. Now, I don't want to be too technical, so we're going to stay high level. Um, but the point is that here that I have is each step or many of these steps, there are places where there are also issues of intellectual property or there could be infringement, right? So how much a, how much intellectual property is used or consumed create to create an output of a step and an input to a next step? So um, the st six major steps really are data collection, collecting the information, collecting the tune, right? Collecting all the characteristics and all the metadata and all the sounds from the song, pre-processing, feature extraction app and classification, which is where the AI says, okay, this is a guitar, this is a drum, you know, this is, this is a melody, right? This is an ABCD, right? Uh, actual training of the model, the reinforcement learning where the model is training and it's learning from itself. That's what we call the feedback loop. And then the end is the fine tuning and the specialization. So if we were to go a little bit more into detail, um, the data collection is gathering, I'm going to stay high level here, gathering and, and tagging the information about the song. Um, the pre-processing, a lot of times that involves getting the files just into a suitable format, uh, making sure that uh, the mix is okay, making sure that the AI can discern between each line, between each instrument, between each backup singer, those types of things, right? So there's a lot of extraction at the uh, song level. Um, and that extraction also <clears throat> goes to the next step where we classify what these actually things are that we have extracted. Then we go to the training where uh, we feed all this to the AI and the AI says, oh, okay, I recognize this drum fill. This is this kind of drum fill. Oh, I recognize these chords. Okay, this is a one, four, five chord progression, so on and so, and so forth. It looks at chord progressions, rhythms, song structures, and really, really starts to learn, classifies these things and creates this huge structure, this huge taxonomy where, uh, think of it as a almost like a regular hierarchy where it, it makes its own catalog, a glossary of things that it can refer back and cross-reference back to. And then those are used in the training and feedback loop where AI uh, you know, uh, says, okay, here's what I have. And then we tell the AI, oh, here's what you did wrong. Here's what it could be a little bit better. And then we just keep refining. So the training and feedback loop, loop is the refinement. And then we have the fine, the, the, the fine tuning. So let's jump in to the next slide. So I want to get to the controversy that um, we'll get to the the most recent famous one of the weekend, but let's get into some 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 recent things here. Um, in 2020, Warner Music came out with AI generated music that 
was uh, at the time also like a, a really big a really big event. It was created by something that was called Endel, which created personalized sound environments. Um, the album was composed and produced completely by a AI. And the question like, right away that was like, people like, who owns this music? Is it the AI? Is it the developers? Is it the label? And <clears throat> it wasn't that controversial as more as it was eye-opening. So there wasn't a legal dispute, but the awareness around this lo looming legal crisis or what was about to happen, that seed was planted. Okay. And then things uh, really got to, uh, came to a head with uh, the Jay-Z deepfake controversy. And I believe that was in 2020 as well. I might've gotten the dates juxtaposed on the slides. Forgive me for that. Um, Google is your friend if you want to check it out. Uh, in, in 2019, uh, Jay Z was on uh, appeared on YouTube reciting Shakespeare uh, "To Be or Not to Be" soliloquy. It went viral, and then Jay Z's company, Rock Nation, said, "No, no, no, we can't have that. They should take down notices citing copyright infringement." Although the content was not a direct copy of Jay Z's songs. His voice was synthesized by AI. It was not his voice. It was completely generated by AI. And that sort of got us on the path to where we are now and to where we wound up very recently where The Weeknd, and that is not misspelled. That is the artist's name. It's a Canadian artist named The Weeknd. He's got some pretty cool jams. He had a song, or I should say AI had a song titled Heart on My Sleeve. The song was created completely with AI technology. It was released on TikTok and Spotify, and it mimicked the voice, the lyrics, the styles of both Drake and The Weeknd, and it was indistinguishable from the original artist. It was so indistinguishable that there were people out there saying, hey, I like this better than the original artist. I like this. I'm going to buy this. Uh, obviously, uh, the record companies didn't like that. Neither did the artists. So the song was generated by a TikToker named Ghost Rider. Ghost Rider used AI, um, trained not so elaborately, I think, but enough training, trained uh, the AI on the work of these artists. And the track, uh, released the track on TikTok. It went viral. It got 9 million views before it was finally removed by TikTok and Spotify. Um, legal action was taken against the creator of the song. I don't think that there was any lawsuit, but the important thing here is Universal Group, who was a label for both artists, did file a takedown notice and the song was taken down. Now, even though there wasn't a lawsuit, um, there was enough, I think, ambiguity and enough fear for the platforms to say, hey, we don't want any issues here. Let's take it down. Okay. So in closing, I get back to my concept of in going from innovation to threat to adaptation. Let's look at where we are now. So I think we all agree that AI with, the, with Web3 and quantum computing in there are posed to completely disrupt record companies. So they need to adapt or die fast. The AI is going to create new business models and revenue streams. Great. But the question is, will these models revolve around music that mimics or innovates? And that is important, I think, not just from a legal perspective, but also for a from a cultural perspective, because music should be innovating and going forward. I don't want to just hear a bunch of mimic stuff. I don't need to, I don't need to have uh, 50 extra Beatle albums, right? Uh, so survival for the record companies will in my opinion, be achieved sort of in this middle ground, right? It, and that middle ground is collaboration and collabor collaborative tools. So the example is recording giants cannot stop AI from releasing new records, say by Michael Jackson of the Beatles. Um, but what they can do to grab a piece of this, you know, bonanza or AI bonanza that's, that, that's, that's uh, not going to stop is that they can charge others to collaborate. So um, if, if they can agree with say Michael Jackson's estate and they can go to the AI company and say, okay, you can mimic Michael Jackson's voice. You can use Michael Jackson's voice, AI generated Michael Jackson's voice in your song, but we're going to charge you for it. Right. And that's already started. Right. So uh, people will be able to have 
uh, say Ariana Grande, Grande or Beyonce or one of those artists, do a duet with them in their song and pay for that AI generated Ariana Grande. My question, being a musician myself, is what happens to musicians? Well, good and bad. Everyone becomes Bach. Everyone becomes Miles Davis. Everybody becomes not only a great performer, but can be a great composer. Um, I think that's great. Music production is democratized. But my question is always, when it comes to AI music, at what price? We lose our shared experience as musicians. We lose our shared experience and all that energy that we've put in and practicing piano, practicing guitar, building our chops, um, we lose that. And, you know, that's a whole other discussion, but uh, I think that's a very key takeaway. And the last thing is we lose our gigs. Uh, nobody wants to see a bunch of AI robots on stage, but I think the more AI music that we consume, uh, the less possibilities there are uh, as musicians, both live and recorded music, in my opinion. All right. So uh, if you have any questions, if you have any comments, concerns, love to hear from you. And I appreciate everyone's uh, participation. You've been a lovely audience, quoting the Beatles down there from Sgt. Pepper. So thank you again. I really appreciate uh, pre being here with you today. Thank you.